again, good morning. It's so good and such an honor to be able to be with you uh, this Sunday on this most important of all Sundays. You know, every Sunday uh, is important, and it's certainly every Sunday is a celebration of the death and resurrection uh, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But today is extra special. This is Easter Sunday. You know, Christmas is important. We remember and we celebrate the incarnation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that God came down, put on flesh, became one of us. Uh, Good Friday is also important because we remember that Jesus went to the cross and he died for our transgressions. But Easter Sunday is a Sunday above all of them because without the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ from the grave, the truth is the incarnation and the crucifixion are really of little importance to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul wrote this, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also, who all who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very foundation of all of our faith and our belief. Everything else depends upon it. It is our hope for this life and in the next. This is why the historic evidence for the resurrection is so important to understand. Because our hope depends upon it. You know, many think of the idea of a resurrection as just being far too much, just too much to possibly believe. But consider the proofs uh, for the resurrection, because they're important for us to realize. Uh, The first proof of the resurrection is that the tomb was empty. When those first women came to the tomb that Jesus was buried in, they found an empty tomb. No one argues against this fact. Some said that the disciples must have, uh, must have snuck in and maybe stolen the body away. Uh, but the Gospels, they tell us uh, of disciples who were full of fear. They abandoned Jesus. They ran away. They were hiding in a room locked. It's really unlikely that the folks who were such full of fear for the Jewish authorities uh, would have had it in them uh, to go and to steal away, overpowering the guards and steal away the body of Jesus. Some people say it's a big, it was a big conspiracy derived from the disciples just to perpetuate the idea that Jesus actually rose from the grave. Well, as Chuck, the late Chuck Colson uh, one of the uh, main uh, architects of the Water State, uh, Watergate conspiracy, pointed out from his own experience, uh, it's absolutely impossible. When that many people are involved in any conspiracy, it is absolutely impossible to keep someone, even just one person, from revealing the truth, especially at the threat of death. There's also the reality that if the tomb really was not empty, and this was just a trick, uh, on the disciples' part, or on just on the writers of the gospel, then the Jewish and Roman authorities would have simply just have produced the body. They would have produced the body of Jesus just to put an end to all the rumors. Because the last thing they wanted uh, was for Jesus to people to believe that Jesus had actually risen from the grave. The second proof for the resurrection of Jesus is the first witnesses of the resurrection. The gospel accounts of the empty tomb all agree that women were the first witnesses of the empty tomb, of the resurrection. Uh, And and as we read this morning in Mark's gospel, it was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome. Uh, In the first century world, the testimony of women was considered invalid. Uh, If the gospel writers were simply making this up, uh, trying to stake a case, uh, they would never have tried to perpetuate a a lie using women as having been the first witnesses. Unless, of course, it really is true. It actually happened this way, and they were just being faithful to the events as they had received them. The third proof for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the disciples' newfound courage. As I said a moment ago, uh, in the Gospels, it tells us how terrified these people were. They were hiding away in fear for the Jews and the Roman authorities. They had abandoned Jesus. They locked themselves up in the upper room. But something significant 
happened in their lives to give them courage. What that something was was an encounter with the risen Christ. It emboldened them to break out of their shelter of fear and begin to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. The fourth proof of the resurrection is that disciples actually died for their faith and belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If they had, if this indeed had just been some big lie, some conspiracy they had drummed up uh, just to get some support, to perpetuate a myth uh, that Jesus had risen from the grave, they would never have been willing to die for that truth. They wouldn't die for a lie. Yet nearly all of them were martyred because of their belief and conviction that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. Don't ever let someone tell you that there is no evidence for the resurrection. There is evidence of plenty. But as as Christians, though, the resurrection is not only the foundation of our faith, the reason for the hope that we have in this life and the next, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave is the lens through which we see the world around us. So how we see everything else. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but by it I see everything else. As followers of Jesus Christ, we see all of life through the lens of the resurrection. It's what helps us make sense of the world. It's what gives us hope. It's the reality that brings joy into our and peace into our lives. It's the truth that chases the fear and the worries of the world away when they inevitably creep in. And it gives us the courage and the strength to face the, all the dangers of life, just as it did for those first disciples who experienced the risen Christ for themselves in their lives and were willing to die for that truth. You know, for over a year now, we've gotten uh, up close and personal with a lot of fear and a lot of worry. But the truth is, we've always been people who are prone to fear and worry. But this past year's certainly been especially difficult. Uh, While by many respects, things appear to be getting better, uh, even now, though, we're still given plenty to worry about, right? If you just watch the news, uh, some reports that the, another spike is going to come. Some reports that the, the vaccine isn't going to be able to do enough, that you're still going to get COVID. The truth is there is and always will be lots of reasons for fear and worry. Because fear and worry enter our lives when we're facing uncertainty, When something is uncertain, it creates fear, worry, anxiety in our lives. Because the one thing we hate more than anything else is uncertainty. We want things to be predictable. At least I know I do. We want to know that if we do certain things, uh, that the outcome uh, will be what we expect it to be. We want it to be predictable. This past year, though, has been anything but predictable. And the truth is, life never really was predictable in the first place. And the result of it, though, has been lots of fear and worry. We've all felt it. We've all been dealing with it in different ways and to different degrees. But if not the worries of of this virus, uh, it's inevitably been something. We're dealing with some fear or worry in our life. Lives. Maybe it's social unrest. Maybe it's the economic uncertainties. Maybe it's the, the state of our country. Maybe it's the, you've had, suffered the loss of a loved one. Maybe there's a broken relationship in your life. These things can just consume us. And when they begin to consume us, the fear and the worry of the, uh, of the uncertainty of it all can be quite debilitating. But again, I said as a, as a people, as followers of Christ, we, we see everything through the lens of the resurrection. And so what does the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead speak into the fear and the worries that so plague our lives? Well, I believe our reading this morning from Mark 16 helps us a lot in this regard. Because Mark 16 verses 1 through 8, it is chocked full of fear and worry. In fact, three different times we're told that the women who came to anoint Jesus' body were full of fear. That first Easter morning as Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went to the tomb, 
of that same tomb that Mary had already seen with her own eyes, Jesus' body laid in. They went that morning expecting, fully expecting to find Jesus' dead body there because they had seen him die. They had witnessed his burial. They had witnessed them put him in the tomb. So it was reasonable. All of us would have done the same to expect and to find Jesus' dead body sitting in that tomb. That's why they spent money going and buying the spices. That's why as they were making their way to the tomb, they wondered, we're told, they wondered who in the world is going to roll away this stone, this heavy stone from its entrance so that they could go in and anoint his body. Uh, There was not one thought in their mind as they went there that morning that Jesus' body would not be there. They were certain about what they were going to find that morning. But when they arrived, the unexpected happened. The very large stone had been rolled away from the tomb's entrance. When they went inside, instead of finding the, uh, an empty, quiet tomb full of death as they had expected, what they saw was a young man dressed in a white robe. This was not what they were expecting. And naturally, this unexpected sight, it filled them with fear. It filled them with worry. Verse 5 tells us that they were alarmed They were alarmed at what they experienced, this unexpected sight. It filled them with alarm. You know, I don't don't think this translation fully does justice, though, to what they were feeling, what was going on inside them that morning, because that word means to be greatly astonished, so much so to be out of one's senses. It's the same word, actually, that's used to describe Jesus' emotional state in the Garden of Gethsemane before his death, before his betrayal and arrest. When he was there and he was, and he was going to, for his father in prayer, it tells us he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. These women were understandably distressed. They were fearful. They were worried. Their hearts were troubled because they found something that was totally unexpected in the tomb. Aware of their fear and their worry, the messenger said this to them. Do not be alarmed. Do not be alarmed. You know, Jesus had said plenty of times to his disciples, do not worry. Do not be anxious. Fear not. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You know, when I have to admit, whenever I hear those words, I become a little bit pessimistic. Uh, do not be alarmed. Don't worry. Don't, don't fear. I'm afraid that alarm and fear and worry are such a normal part of my life that, uh, that when I hear those, I just don't quite get it. Why shouldn't we be worried? Life is uncertain. Things happen all the time that are out of our control. And if we can't control the events of life, then we can never be certain about the outcome. And that's always reason for worry and fear. But no sooner had the messenger of God said, do not be alarmed, that he then went on to give them the reasons why there was nothing for them to fear. And this is what he said. He said, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he had told you. And that first Easter message, because that's what that was. That was the first Easter sermon right there. Uh, That first Easter message, the angel of the Lord gave them three reasons why they have nothing to fear. Number one, because Jesus was crucified, he said. Number two, it's because Jesus has risen. And number three, it's because Jesus is not here. And that, my friends, that, my friends, because of those three realities, we too have nothing to to fear in this life or the next. But why? Well, let's look at them each for just a moment. First of all, the the messenger proclaimed Jesus was crucified. You know, we call the Friday that Jesus died on the cross Good Friday for a reason. Yet it seems strange to call someone's death a good day, doesn't it? But that's exactly what it was. Uh, I remember seeing uh, a while back the comic strip BC. I don't know if anyone's, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it, those who actually uh, used to look at 
if they still come out, I don't even know. Uh, but there were two of the cavemen who were talking to each other in the cartoon, uh, and it was obviously one that came out on Good Friday. When the first uh, caveman said uh, to his friend, I hate the term Good Friday. And the second caveman said, why? And he said, because my Lord was hanged on a tree that day. Well, the second man replied, well, if you were going to be hanged on a tree that day, and he volunteered to take your place, how would you feel? He said, good. He said, have a nice day. (laughs) It was good because Jesus died on the cross, the death that we all deserve for our sin and our rebellion. He took our place on the cross. Our sins were atoned for once and for all through Jesus, our substitute. Jesus willingly took upon himself the death that we deserve. When we put our faith in him and his death on the cross, we're washed clean. Our sins are forgiven. Our debt has been paid in full because Jesus was crucified Dying in our place, we no longer have to worry about whether or not we are good enough or worthy enough for God. Because our worth is no longer measured by the things we do or the things we fail to do. God accepted Jesus' sacrifice in our place. By faith then in Christ, we are accepted by God, not through our own worthiness, but rather through the sacrificial death of his son. But Jesus wasn't just sacrificed for our sins. That on its own wouldn't be enough. The second reason why we have nothing to fear in life or death is that Jesus has risen. Through his crucifixion, Jesus dealt with the problem of sin. Through his death, Jesus dealt with our problem of death. For the wages of sin is death. By conquering death through the power of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus has conquered death as well. When we put our faith in Christ, we are born into a new and unending life in Him that begins now in this life and lasts for all eternity. Romans 6, 4 says, Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in the newness of life. In 1 Corinthians 6, 14, it says, God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Ephesians 2, 6 says, Though Jesus, through Jesus' resurrection, we are raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. When we have put our faith in Christ, we are raised with him to new and unending life, not by our own good works or deeds, but by the power of God that was at work in raising his own son from the grave. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have nothing to fear because through his crucifixion, our sins have been forgiven. And through his resurrection, we have been given new and unending life with God. We have hope in this life and in the next. But there's one more reason that the messenger of God gave those women for why we should not be afraid. The third reason that we have nothing to fear in life or death is that Jesus is not here. Now, the first two reasons maybe were fairly obvious enough. Uh, At least we hear them all the time, right? But the third reason is maybe a little bit more subtle. Why in the world would the fact that Jesus is not here be a reason not to worry? Uh, In fact, it would make more sense if if what we had heard was uh, that Jesus is here with you now. Uh, That would certainly have made me feel feel a little less fearful, right? A little more comforted that he was right there. But it doesn't. The messenger of the Lord says he is not here. Well, what exactly does that mean? Because we certainly know that, that Jesus is with us. He promised that he never leaves us or forsake us, forsakes us. Uh, but if we stop for a minute and, and consider the full context of what the messenger is saying, it provides a great deal of confidence and trust in God and in his power of the resurrection uh, when it comes to facing our own worries and fears in this life. It was the fact that Jesus wasn't there in that moment that was such good news. Jesus went ahead of them to Galilee, and there they were promised that they would see him just as he had told them. And they did. 
there are a couple really important revelations here for our, uh, for our lives as followers of Christ. First of all, what this tells us is this, that the risen Christ is at work. He's at work. He went before them. His work, therefore, it didn't finish in his death and in his resurrection. He didn't simply go back to heaven when it was all over and just enjoy his retirement. Uh, his plan for proclaiming the gospel in many ways it had just begun. Now that he had full, fulfilled his mission by conquering sin and death, it was now time to mobilize the team, to encourage them to equip and equip them with the power to continue the, me- the mission. So what does this mean for those who, for of us who put our faith in the risen Jesus? What this means is that he continues to be at work in this world. It didn't end. Easter Sunday wasn't the end of his work. No matter how bad things may seem in the world or in our lives, Jesus is at work. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, uh, Paul makes it very clear that Jesus is at work reconciling all things to himself. And because his work continues, this reconciling work, our mission is never complete. There's no retiring from the mission of our risen Christ. We are always ministers, missionaries of his gospel. We are always tasked with the same work of proclaiming the kingdom, that the kingdom has come and that new and unending life is now available to all people who put their faith in Christ. We are to be about the reconciling work of our risen Savior. It also means that Jesus is always in control. Jesus is sovereign over the affairs of the world. And when Jesus is in control of our lives, we have nothing to fear because we can take him at his word. Jesus told them earlier in Mark 14, verse 28, he told them before he died, after I am raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And he was true to his word, which means that we can trust Jesus We can take him at his word uh, and all of his promises, like the one he made in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Friends, just like with the disciples, Jesus has gone before us. He has gone to prepare a place for us in his Father's house. And because of the resurrection, he will come again and will take us to be with him forever. What that means is just like he said, go on to Galilee. He's gone ahead of you. You're going to see him there. What What we're being told by Jesus is that he's gone ahead of us. And we are going to see him there when we get there one day soon. Friends, Jesus was crucified. Jesus is risen. And Jesus has gone before us to prepare a place for us. When you add it all up, there is nothing to fear in life. Because of the resurrection, we have hope in this life and the next. Life may be unpredictable. It's therefore going to be the cause of a lot of worry and fear. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, our lives are certain. Our sins are forgiven. Death has been defeated. And through Christ, we will be with him in paradise. When we put our faith in Jesus, we have nothing to fear in life or death. Are you sick and tired of the fears and the worries of this uncertain world? Put your faith and the risen Christ, and enjoy the certainty of life with him forever. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Yeah.